talk today about something that's very important and I think uh, does us all well to certainly keep in mind from time to time, and that is how do we keep God real in our lives? Now, uniquely enough, the Bible, the Bible is consistently one of the publishing best-selling books every year. It's amazing. And yet, ironically, it's one of the least read books <laughs> in addition. Consistently least read books. It's consistently one of the most popular purchased books, and yet it is one of the most consistently least read books. Amazing, just amazing uh, paradox and kind of a conundrum in, in many respects. And, and frankly, herein lies a major reason why God is not real to most people. How can you think something's going to be real to you if you don't consistently take time to learn about it, whatever it is, whatever it is. The reality of all things depends on your familiarity, does it not, with it? And, and or your interaction with it? Or your, your actual touching and digesting, whatever it may be, through your five senses? And that makes it real because you're able then to see it having impact in your life. You're able to see it have influence in your life. You're able to see certain results, perhaps, in your life from it. And these are how realities impact us and actually cause change. This book, this book can cause change. It can really cause your life to change in major ways, especially if you break away from the traditional deception associated with this particular book, the Christian, Judeo-Christian book, the Old and New Testament. I don't know about the Koran. I'm not that well educated in the Koran. I've read it. I do know some things what it says. That's another story. I'm not that familiar with what the Buddhists use in terms of their holy rite or writ. But the fact of it is, talking today about this book and the true God of the universe and the true God, the Word, the one we call Yahshua, Jesus, Christos, as well as the Father, this book is all about them, the angelic host, Satan the devil. It's about a lot of reality of this world that you and I are a part of that many people don't recognize because they're not familiar with the revealed knowledge, revealed knowledge that this book contains. And it is revealed knowledge. Oh yeah, there are some things that you can definitely confirm that should add confidence to you that this book does indeed know what it's talking about because you can prove the validity and the substance of this book through fulfilled prophecy. There's a lot of history in this book. There's a lot of future history in this book, which is nothing more than prophecy. There's a lot of situation ethics and advice and laws of morality and ethics and how to manage your personality in this book. You talk about a psychology book? This book will help you keep things in simple perspective. So often today in our psychology circles, people overthink things. There is a very simple thing or simple, in often cases, uh, techniques on how to manage your life. And it starts with, you know what? I don't mean to oversimplify it, but it starts with just doing it. Just do it. Don't get around to it, because <laughs> that oftentimes, that doesn't happen. You just keep missing it. You never do get around to it. Matter of fact, I had a guy give me a, get, get a little get around to it. He gave me a round to it. <laughs> it's a kind of a joke that he gave me, because I don't know why, but nevertheless, that's what he did. And people have this in their mind that, you know, well, you never do get around to it. Well, yeah, you should. You should just get down and do it. Make a decision, 
get it done. And oftentimes, just getting it done takes care of all of the other stuff that oftentimes becomes just distraction noise and generates just unnecessary anxiety and stress that then you end up wondering, well, what's wrong with me? And that just complicates things when, in fact, if we just would do some things, uh, it certainly would help us, I think, to clear the board, as they say. But this book, not knowing it, does result in a lot of folks complicating their lives. And it does prevent people from having a real relationship with God when one does not take the time to read about God. So I want to challenge all of you today. I want to challenge all of you today. If you haven't done this, then I think it's time to do it. If you have done it, perhaps it's been a while since you did do it last. And consequently, maybe it'd be a good time to do it again. <laughs> But I have um, some sheets of paper, yes, I forgot to bring them up here, of which actually gives you a pace to read the Bible and complete it in one year. And that may sound like a big job to read this whole book in one year, but you can do it by reading three or four chapters a day or about 25 chapters a week. 25 chapters a week, easily you'll finish this book with no problem. So I'd like to challenge all of you. I'm going to put this up here. You guys can get them. They're, uh, uh, actually, it's broken down into each day, going from January all the way to December 31st. even gives you what scriptures to read, what chapters to read, and, and how to proceed down through all the books of the Bible. So if you're interested in it, uh, certainly I'd encourage all of you to... Uh, go ahead and, and uh, try to look at that and certainly uh, take some time and develop the discipline. Develop the discipline. If nothing else, just develop the discipline of reading the Bible every day. And I know we're busy, but I guarantee if you don't take the time, it won't happen. It won't happen. It just don't happen. You have to make oftentimes conscious decisions to do this. Do you know why Jesus said those who enter the kingdom of God take it by force? Consider that statement. That's in your Bible. Consider that statement. Why do those who enter into the kingdom of God take it by force? Because they're passionately determined not to allow anything to detour them off of their objectives of getting into that kingdom. In other words, they're very focused on Matthew 6, verse 33, which is all about seeking the kingdom first, and then all those other things will be added unto you. So it's important, uh, certainly, that I think uh, we do take the time to familiarize ourselves with the Bible. But reading the Bible, of course, is only part of the challenge, because reading the Bible for what it says is just that. It's reading. If you don't know what you're reading about, and that's what oftentimes is the complaint. Well, I'm reading the Bible, but I don't understand. I can't even pronounce the names. You know, I even have trouble pronouncing some of the names uh, in, in the Bible. And why, why are they telling me all these genealogies of this guy begetting that guy and that guy begetting that guy and these people begetting them and then so forth and so on? And, and uh, oh my, I mean, the book of Chronicles is like watching paint dry, you know? <laughs> and I got to read through that. But yet, brethren, there is good reason for this. And that brings me to the next uh, important point about studying your Bible is to consider the fact that you must gain understanding. You must mix understanding with your reading. Turn over here with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 for a moment. This is important because this is what the Bible does for you and for me. It states here in verse 15 of chapter 3, 2 Timothy, we read, and from a child, and Paul's writing to Timothy. Now, Paul knew Timothy. Apparently, he also knew Timothy's grandmother, Loie. And uh, he mentions uh, about her, too, in these uh, letters here to Timothy. But Timothy was a young man, maybe in his teens, early 20s. Most scholars will tell you he was in his late teens. Paul was mentoring him to basically be 
a minister and a servant, an evangelist. And uh, here he says, and that from a child, talking to Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which indicates that it's important to teach your children. It goes without saying. The Bible is very critical on that. It's very, very open about that. Teach your children when they're young, so that when they're young, if indeed they do forget, they'll always have that as a default bit of information and knowledge to hopefully at some point when they've hurt themselves enough they'll realize they should have never left and will go back to where they came from but and that's that's also proverbial in the proverbs as well you teach a child when they're young and hopefully they will return when they're old in due time and in due course but at any rate here paul indicates timothy was indeed taught as a child, uh, he's known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 16, this is important to recognize what the Bible can do for us. This is what the Bible can do for us. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine. It is profitable for absolutes in your life. There are absolutes. There are doctrines. There are definitive statements in the Bible that are immovable. They are the same yesterday, today, and forever. They are stationary. They are like big objects, big boulders that cannot be moved. They are the, the, the petra of, of knowledge and are just very, very anchored and give you, hopefully, solid basis for developing your life around. And it says here, it is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. That's correction. If you honestly approach the Bible with an open mind and with humility as a student that is going to be teachable, you can actually learn how to change yourself. You can actually, through the advice and the suggestions that are portrayed in the Bible, if applied to you and you find yourself in areas of transgression or in areas of, of uh, conflict with what the words are being said, you can actually change your life by implementing, deploying, employing the advice that this Bible, these words, Old and New Testament, have to offer in, in the way of reproof. For correction, for instruction in righteousness, you can learn how to be favored by God. You can learn how to be favored by God. You want to know how to please God? This will give you instructions. The Old and New Testament will give you instructions on how to make God smile at you, how to get on his good side, how to be favorable with God. That the man of God may be perfect, or in this particular case, he may be fresh, or he may be complete, thoroughly, comprehensively furnished unto all good works or uh, expectations, works that are expected, all good works. And that needs to be defined because, again, I, I often say, and I don't mean to oversimplify things, but there are people who think good works are flying airplanes into buildings and killing people. There are people in this world that think beheading people are good works. That's good works. There are people in this planet today that think that that's the way God is pleased. They're confused. There are people on this planet, brethren, that are truly confused about God. The Old and the New Testament is here for all of us to understand how we can truly please God and how we can truly get his favor and accrue his recognition in this particular area. Verse 15 of the second chapter, 2 Timothy. Look at this. Study. It says, that means take time out of your busy life. Stop the merry-go-round, as they say. Make some time. It's important. You study to show yourself approved unto God. You need validation. You need, hopefully, some recognition and understanding about how you're doing unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth. And then he says, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And, and you do get into a lot of debates that oftentimes just waste your time. And I've often said, as it's been said before by others, that if God can't get, or if Satan, that is, if Satan can't get at you directly, he will get at you indirectly by wasting your time chasing rabbits down holes that don't matter. So you have to prioritize in your life. You have to make determinations on what you're going to spend your time on and how you are indeed going to study to show yourself approved. Notice this over here in 1 Timothy. While we're still in Timothy, go to 1 Timothy and in chapter 4, chapter 4. And we had a sermon a couple months back on meditation. It says, meditate upon these things. There you go. Meditate on what? Meditate on the substance of this information. That's what you should fill your mind with. Not the, um, and make your mind go blank, you know, and look at a butterfly flapping its wings over and over and over for about 10 minutes as it's taking whatever it takes from a, from a flower. I mean, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about meditating on the knowledge and the information and learning how to apply it to yourself for improving one's self. It talks about here, meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them. Submit yourself. Concede to what the advice or suggestions recommend. That the profane may appear, that the, I'm sorry, that the profiting may appear to all. That your profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you shall both save yourself and them that hear you. In other words, again, the instruction being to Timothy, as it is to all of us, walk the walk. Walk the walk. As they say, walk the walk, walk the talk. If you're going to talk, walk that talk. Walk the walk. Walk the way. That's how you learn. That's how you really make it real to yourself because guess what? When you walk what you talk and you're really walking that walk, now it becomes real to you. And how does it become real to you? Because you see differences in your life. You'll see different reactions from people when you don't snap back at them and you learn to control your temper. You learn to control your anger. You learn to control your language. You learn to control your imagination. You see things that are different and different reactions come back at you to where your life begins to change by virtue of just the reactionary environment that you're creating by the control of your own spirit. Try not to raise your voice. Try not to be excitable. Try to change, in some cases, the tones of your voice and how you react and how you talk. Maybe because we're so familiar with certain ones of us in our own families, we've forgotten to say how, how to say please or to say thank you. I'm one for that. I'm trying to teach myself, reteach myself. Thank you, Marge, for doing that. You know, please, can I do that? Or can you do that? Or please, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little levity. I don't say that to Margie. That's what she says to me. <laughs> but it's important. We all begin to learn how to modify. If you don't modify behavior, brethren, and don't see the changes in your life, then you're wasting your time because Christianity is all about conversion. It's the conversion process that generates the reality. It's the really believing, the real belief in. It's the believing of realities that are in your Bible that help us all to be comforted. I, was, when, I, I went to a, a funeral this last week. The individual who died was a former serviceman, a technician that I worked with for about seven years in water treatment. He was 68 years old. It was a reality check for me. I was his boss for about seven years. Uh, taught, he taught me and I taught him a lot about water treatment. He was one of a, a threesome that were just a, a real diamond trio in my service technician department. This guy's name was Al. Uh, there was two others that were his buddies and they were all Amishmen. They all only had eighth grade educations. Every one of them were brought up riding a horse and buggy. And they got into water uh, treatment at, in a, um, 
uh, residential level. And then when I came into this company, I opened up a, uh, a water purification processing, fluid processing division within that company. And I was able to take from the pool of existing service technicians from these guys. And this fella, Al, was one of those three musketeers that I took. And he died of cancer. And I knew his wife, Dorothy. I knew his wife, Dorothy. And there was, I mean, to tell you, there were hundreds of people there at the funeral when I went. And I, re I reconnected with a lot of those guys that I hadn't seen in about 20 years. And it was good to reconnect with them. But you know, in going up there and talking to Dorothy, because she comes from a very traditional Amish background, very traditional Christian with a German flavor paradigm, which is what the Amish have, but they're very traditional, and they believe that, you know, Al hopefully is in heaven. I mean, that's basically their belief. And how I wanted to say some things to Dorothy, but I didn't. I really didn't because it wouldn't have been uh, appropriate, and I didn't really have time because there were about 50 to 60, maybe 100 people behind me, <laughs> and I didn't want to take up too much of her time. But be that as it may, what you know in this, brethren, is, is so, so comforting to know the truth about loved ones who are okay, who are okay. There's nothing that you have to worry about in terms of them because they are just in line waiting for their time. And you don't have to worry about where you're going when you pass. I mean, I know some of us say, no, I'm, well, you're right, Bill. I don't worry about dying. I just worry about how I'm going to die, you know. And I get that. <laughs> I get that, too, because none of us want to die with a lot of pain and, and so forth and a lot of drama associated with the, uh, with the action. But the bottom line is there is great comfort in knowing full well that death is nothing to fear. And your Bible tells you very clearly that's doctrinal, see, that's absolute. That doesn't change. There's no argument. There's no question about the fact when you die, you go to sleep. And you wait for the resurrection. And God willing, you'll hear your voice and you will come however it happens, bursting up out of the dirt or being remanifested into a spirit body from wherever your spirit of man was kept. And you will meet Christ in the air and land with him on the Mount of Olives. That's doctrinal. There's nothing traditional about that. Unfortunately, most of the Christian world doesn't even know that. How nice would it be to be able to sit before 5, 10, 20 million people and tell them about the kingdom of God and that Jesus Christ is really coming back to earth? It's tremendous stuff, brethren. Tremendous stuff. And I hope we're passionate about it. We should be. And it's all here. It's all here. All we've got to do is rightly divide the word of God and allow this information to literally change us in, in the ways that, God willing, it can. Over here in Romans chapter 15, notice this. Chapter 15, whatsoever things, verse 4 in chapter 15, book of Romans, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it important to study your Bible? So that we all can come to a common belief of what's in here. If you don't study your Bible, you'll be subjected to your own imagination and begin to drift into areas that are not so much necessarily in your Bible because you have, as I have, a tendency that if we're not connected to this information to afford our imaginations to run wild with us. So it's important we study our Bible so that we can secure our relationships with each other and have a commonality among ourselves with at least some of the basic doctrinal beliefs that the Bible has to offer to all of us here. Notice here in the book of Acts how they were complimented. Acts chapter 17, you know the story. I'll just jump into the uh, context here for the sake of time. And the brethren immediately, this was Paul, he was uh, traveling at the time, and he uh, sent away Paul, Silas, by night, here in this case, unto the city of Berea, 
who coming there went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble, that is, those people in Berea, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they, they received the word, they heard it with all readiness. They were humble enough, they were meek enough, they were teachable enough, they were open-minded enough, they heard the word, they allowed it to penetrate their brains and afforded them the opportunity to contemplate and to comprehend the information, the knowledge, and the concepts that were being advanced. They received the word with all readiness of mind, but notice this, and searched the scriptures Weekly? Monthly? Daily. Daily. They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews, then the story continues. So the point of it is, as a result of searching the scriptures and confirming the fact that these things were indeed true of what they were being told by the apostles, in this particular case it was Paul, they confirming that then allowed themselves to believe these things. And the conviction is, of course, and it comes far more with more meaning and more impact if you yourself come to grips with believing these things by virtue of your confirmation of the information you receive. And that's why, uh, and, I, and I certainly uh, hope it will never change, the Church of God International is a very biblically-based church of God. We do the best we can to stay connected and to stay in line with Scripture so that what we say is supported with Scripture and actually even take the time, and I hope that you would, would see and recognize and appreciate the fact that in most cases, every speaker that comes before you, at least in the Church of God International I can speak for, will usually be using Scripture to prove what they're advancing so that you can be searching the Scriptures right along with the speaker as he goes through some of the things that he does indeed advance and say. And that's important. But it is also important for you to expand on those things. So searching the scriptures is very important. It's very important, brethren, that you take the time to also challenge yourself. And I want to encourage all of you. There's been a lot of work and a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of hours put into the development of our website. There are topics and subjects on that website that uh, many of you perhaps have not explored because there are so many uh, documents there now, booklets, pamphlets, reprint articles on everything from soup to nuts. <laughs> I mean, there is a wide variety of all kinds of topics and subjects there for your reading, for your study, for your investigation, for challenging you to maybe change a belief on something or to modify a belief on something. And I encourage you to go ahead on the website, get the Home Bible Study Course, for instance. There's 15, I think, lessons there of the Home Bible Study Course. It goes from repentance, then it goes through uh, the holy days there. It is um, a kind of, um, yeah, it starts with repentance, it goes with faith and baptism, the laying out of hands, the resurrection, uh, understanding the eternal judgment, which is basically, you know, where we got these from. Hebrews chapter 6. These are the foundational doctrines of the church. Turn with me for a moment. Look at over here. Hebrews chapter 6, just so that you know, these are, these are fundamentals that all of us need to be rooted in because what Paul's saying here in chapter 6 that he wants to now leave the principles of these doctrines, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of uh, laying on of hands and repentance from dead works and faith toward God and the doctrine of baptisms, the resurrection of the dead, eternal He's not saying we're going to forget this and do away with it. No, 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 no. He's talking about, look, I assume you already know about that. I assume you've got that 2020 already and you understand it down to your bones and into the marrow of those bones. So now what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the meat of the word because as far as I'm concerned, Paul is saying essentially here in Hebrews that conceptually knowing these things, that is milk. Anybody can comprehend it. Anybody can understand it intellectually. My dad understood some of these things intellectually. I would sit down and talk to him, and he'd say, well, Billy, that's pretty interesting, you know? And that's about as far as he would go. Because guess what? He wasn't ready for the meat. 
And what was the meat? Actually adopting, actually embracing the information so that my life would change in the process that we call conversion. See, that's the meat of the word. That's where Paul's going with this. He wants now us to start incorporating, inculcating, and taking it into where it actually transforms us into something new. That's what it's all about. That's what this book is all about. It's not about magic. It's about God's Holy Spirit. Literally, if you're baptized and have had hands laid on you, if you're baptized and have hands laid on you, that you've got God's Holy Spirit, you've got a changing empowerment in you that if you would allow and engage it for the changes it offers you, can actually achieve changes. Actually make yourself different than what you were a month, two months, three months ago. Then it goes into uh, Sabbath, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Understanding Day of Pentecost, but it's all there on the website, the study course, 15 lessons that you can go through one at a time, once a month. Our mappers, uh, the guys that are in the ministerial apprentice program, the map program, they go through one lesson a month, and then we talk about it, we evaluate it, we go through, there's a test at the end of them as well, to learn the knowledge of this information so that you can embrace it as part of your lifestyle and as part of the things that do, in fact, transform your mind. Now, in order to get this done, and I, and I get the fact that we've got iPhones today. I get the fact that, you know, you probably have Bibles, maybe more than one Bible on your iPhone. I've got the whole Strong's Concordance on my Bible, and I use it quite regularly. As a matter of fact, I've gotten accustomed to using it rather than my old uh, Concordance, the, uh, hard, the hard-covered uh, Strong's Concordance. It's falling apart anyway, but uh, it's quicker. I can get to things faster and uh, certainly look up words. I can even be sitting there in the audience, and if I use a Greek word, I can check you out and make sure I can go right to that Strong's Concordance and see if that you know, guy is using the right word, the great Greek word, and giving me the right meaning, because it'll come up right on my, on my iPhone. And I get that. However, what I'm talking about is study time. I'm talking about really taking time out and having some study time. You need a Bible. You need a Bible. You should have a Bible. You really should. And you should have a Bible to the point where it's personalized for you. In other words, don't be afraid to mark it up. Color it. Emphasize, underline it. Take time. Develop a system. You know, some people, uh, they, uh, I, I wrote down here, one, one system is green, which is about Christian living. You highlight green, Christian living. See, I've got, I've got certain ones highlighted in my Bible. I've got colors in my Bible. Uh, some have used uh, red as prophecy, blue, the kingdom of God, uh, orange is the devil, yellow. So if I go to that, I know what I'm, I'm into, if I can remember my color codes. <laughs> I know I'm going to talk about Christian living. You know, red is prophecy. I know this is a prophetic. And uh, so I know where I'm, I'm heading in that regard, and I get myself uh, kind of squared up on that. But this book, my, my Bible, is a workbook. It's a workbook. I've had it for now some 40-some years, and this Bible's been with me. When I take this Bible, the first thing I do is I put it in my briefcase and hide it when it's all done because I don't want anybody get, dumping coffee on it, uh, ripping the pages out of it because it's already seen better days, and I've had it already uh, rebound. But this is my Bible, and it's personal. It's my workbook, wherever it goes. I've often said, if my house burns down, this is what I'm going for. <laughs> this is what I'm going for because it's, uh, it means a lot. We should personalize, have a relationship with God's Word. Now, this is physical, of course, and if it did burn up, so be it, I'd have to deal with it. But my point is, the, the fact that we've got a relationship with God's Word, that's important. You've got to have a relationship with God's Word. You've got to love the information, brethren, and you should love the container the information is in and make it custom-designed for you. Take a personal interest in it. Get yourself a Bible. Get yourself a good Bible. And um, if you can find one that um, is, is uh, helpful in uh, your study time where it's easy to, uh, to read. Now, of course, if it's a study Bible and you want to use concordances, because that's where I'm going next, you need to get yourself some Bible aids. You need to get perhaps a Strong's Concordance. 
Maybe a Bible dictionary, a good one, is Unger's, U-N-G-E-R-S. Unger's Bible Dictionary. You want to know who's who in the Bible? Get an Unger's Bible Dictionary. So then that way when you're reading and you find out you're reading about a guy named Boaz, well, who's Boaz? Well, look it up first in Unger's Bible Dictionary. Read the little... Um, smidgen of information they have on Boaz to get the information in the background. And now you've got it. So now you're reading, now you've got meaning. You know, who was Methuselah? Look it up in Unger's Bible Dictionary. Who's Methuselah? And get a framing, get some context to some of the stories that you're reading. The Bible Dictionary will help you do that. Concordance, as many of you know, is the Greek and the Hebrew and affords you, being not knowing those languages, uh, to, to be able to understand where that English translation came from, and if it's in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, and if it's in the New Testament, the Greek, be able to identify what words were used and arrive at the proper meaning so that in case the translators made a mistake or a misnomer or are misdirecting you in a direction of a word that they use that means something different, like nephish, does not mean immortal soul, it just means air-breathing creature. Hell... Hades doesn't mean a place where there's eternal torment going on, as you're led to believe in traditional Christianity. It means hole in the ground. It means grave. Hades, that's, you know, Sheol in the, in the Hebrew is, is a hole in the ground. It's, it's the grave. So these are important items that all of us, I think, need to uh, consider. Get yourself some additional Bibles. Get a standard revised. Get a, get a new King James uh, version. A good Bible to read if you just want to read is the good news for modern man. It's easy English, it's modern English, and it flows real clearly, and you can read it like a storybook. Good news for modern man. Another one for the New Testament anyway is the Weymouth. The Weymouth Bible translation for the New Testament, not the old, but the, for the new. The Weymouth, W-E-Y-M-O-U-T-H, Weymouth. Uh, very good. It's actually translated from the original Greek uh, scriptures is not a translation of a translation. You know, it's not a paraphrase of sorts. It's a, actually translated right from the Greek uh, manuscripts, the Weymouth Bible. So these are these are things that you 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 can use to help you to uncover, to explore, to uh, exposit in a broader, more comprehensive fashion to provide you better understanding and appreciation for the content that we have here uh, in this book. Do you know how blessed we are to be able to have the manuscripts so condensed that we, every human being, if we could, could actually carry all the manuscripts? Years ago in the Old Testament, they had, to carry, they, they had mules carrying all these scrolls. You couldn't lift all of them. Uh, there's no way. It would be way too heavy. You know, it, the, 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 uh, you'd take a caravan to bring them in, basically, a small caravan. But here we have it all uh, condensed and nicely printed and certainly uh, everything that uh, is there for us. And, and here's my point in all this. I mean, if we don't develop a discipline, brother, of Bible study and challenging ourselves to change from the very dynamic words that are in this Bible, guess what? We're not going to change. We're just going to continue to warm a seat, continue to understand information, take in knowledge, and be filled with a lot of information and knowledge of knowing what is true and what is not, and be able maybe even to be a good debater about this, that, and the other thing, and, and talk somebody down, put them in a corner, slap them on the top of the head a little bit, and uh, show them you know, how much we know and how much you don't know, and that's all fine and dandy, I suppose, but that only goes so far. That only goes so far. Where it really matters is what is this book doing for us in our daily lives? What is it doing for us in our daily lives? Is it just providing us with information? Is it just giving us time to spend, to read three or four chapters a day and take up uh, 15, 20 minutes or however long it will take you to read uh, three chapters or four chapters a day? Or is it really a lifestyle-changing influence. That's important. Let me close with just these particular scriptures to remind us of the very objective of getting acquainted with your Bible, because this is so very important, because without it, that is the acquaintance of the words of God, you're not going to be able to achieve what Paul says here in Romans 12. Let me explain. 
what Paul says here in Romans 12, verse 1. He says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it is a reasonable service considering what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus has given his life for us. He's at the right hand of the Father right now so that we might have salvation, that we might have eternal life that we might have a venue, an access, a doorway into the very kingdom of God. Now, with that being said, I think it's pretty reasonable that we give back a little bit. I mean, that price was paid uh, some 2,000 years ago, and it's enormous. You can't even put a price tag on it. And so Paul says, it's our reasonable service, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. I, I refuse... I refuse to accept as trivial, brethren, you may call me, oh, Bill, you're old-fashioned, or you're making a, a mountain out of a molehill, but I refuse to recognize the fact that January 1 is New Year's. I refuse! I will not submit to Pope Gregory's calendar, you see. Wycliffe would have done the same thing. John Wycliffe, you remember him, many years ago in the 1300s. I was reading about him this morning in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah, he, he was not going to submit. I submit, brethren, New Year's was the civil law, the Feast of Trumpets. That was New Year's. <laughs> and the religious year begins on the 1st of Nisan right before Passover, 14 days before Passover. In the spring, not in the dead of winter, when everything's dead. So the world's confused. The world is definitely confused. And why is it confused? Because we all conformed to it. We've all conformed to it. We need to stand apart from it. You are Christians, brethren, of another, of another citizenship. You don't belong to this world. You're ambassadors for Christ traveling through time temporarily here in this tabernacle, spending time to hopefully learn how to qualify to enter into God's kingdom. Not that we teach. Not that we teach you're saved by works. Uh -uh -uh -uh. We know we are saved by grace. But God does have expectations. And it's important that we understand these expectations are real. And you understand that by taking time to read the word here. And he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, I remember when I started getting involved in this information. In my life at the age of 20 and 21 back then, when it was started, and I started realizing Christmas was not the birthday of Jesus Christ, that he did not get killed on Good Friday. I mean, these were major things. I mean, all my life, my mom and my dad believed this stuff. I was taught that Jesus died on Good Friday. I had an uncle who was a rabid Baptist deacon, and he would argue with me over, he wouldn't even say when I'd go over there when I was, I was uh, you know, with my parents and I'd go over there with him, he wouldn't even say, hi, Billy, how you doing? He would say, this isn't the day of the, the law, Billy, this is the day of, of grace, this is the day of grace. And right off the bat would begin to argue with me about the word of God. My mom and my dad would even look at me. my uncle, Steve was his name, you know. No offense. <laughs> Wondering, you know, what's, what's wrong with Uncle Steve? You know, why, is he, why is he jumping on Billy again, you know? But he knew that I was studying the Bible, and he knew where I was gravitating toward, and he knew that I was beginning to see this Sabbath thing. Sabbath? You're going to start keeping Saturday like the Jews? You're not Jewish, Bill. You know, that's what I would get a lot. You know, what do you mean? And then when I started keeping atonement and all these other days, my parents thought I lost my mind. They thought I lost my mind. They, my my in-laws, Margie's dad and, and uh, my mother-in-law, Teresa, before she came in the church, they thought I was going from one extreme to the other and, and, and literally thought both Margie and I lost our minds. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. Why? Because we were no longer 
conforming to the world's demands, we started realizing, wow, this is a life-transforming bit of information. And what do I mean by that? I mean we got rid of all of our Christmas decorations. That was action. We took them out in boxes. We threw them away or however what we did, but we got rid of them. That was life-changing. See, that, that was a change of life. And no longer did we go to church, not that we did, but wouldn't even think about going to church on Easter Sunday. There's no Easter Sunday. It's a, it's a scam. There is no Easter Sunday. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true, you see. And these are little things we all know, but I say them to make a point. This information, brethren, is life-changing. It's mind-transforming. It changes your whole paradigm. What do you mean you're not going to heaven when you die? What do you mean my dad, who never accepted Jesus Christ, is not burning in hell right now with demons surrounding him, stabbing him with pitchforks, and poking his eyes out? And I could get really gruesome here. But you know how, do you know how happy I am to know that my dad and my mom, who never accepted Jesus Christ, and I'd be only fooling myself to think so, are okay. They're sleeping. They're just sound asleep, waiting for their time. And their time, I'm told, is coming. It's coming. I'm even told when. And I'll know when that time because, I hope, God willing, I'll be a spirit being. And that day, as all of us who would be spirit beings will know, we're approaching the end of the millennium when the rest of the dead will be raised. And I'm going to be right there in the box seat waiting. Wait, hey, where, where's my mom and my dad coming up? You know, how, where should I go? And I'm sure we'll be told. Just stand put. You know, we'll, we'll bring them to you. You know, <laughs> however, however it happens. I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that. All I know is that's happening. And it happens because we've been told it's going to happen. That is doctrine. That's absolute. You don't change that. That is solid as concrete. That is, that is a big, mega, awesome rock, a petra, like I said, that you can't move because it is established as a teaching in your Bible. So here, the apostle says, For I say, verse 3 of Romans 12, through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Ephesians 4, just a few more here, just to illustrate uh, to us how important it is to afford this information we have here to change our minds. Chapter 4, and in verse 23 of the book of uh, Ephesians, Chapter 4, verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put it away, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Kids, don't lie to your parents. Parents, don't lie to your kids. Don't do those kinds of things. Be truthful, be transparent, be honest people. With, with your neighbor, it even says. For we are members one of another. Be you angry and don't sin. You can be angry, but don't sin. In other words, don't hold grudges. Don't think hateful thoughts. Don't, don't harbor murderous ideas with ill will towards somebody. And definitely don't involve yourself with conspiring to hurt someone or to kill someone. I was watching some things while I was exercising, uh, matter of fact, last night on uh, forensic, forensic investigations. The way, I'm t I can't believe people do this to one another. I mean, I'm on my treadmill watching these stories on CNN, I think it was, forensic investigations on these cases of murder and how husbands are killing their wives and wives are killing their husbands and girlfriends of the husbands or the uh, boyfriends of the wives are killing the other mate. And I mean, there's, there's thought, pre-planning. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's conspiring in some cases, payoffs going. I mean, people really think this stuff through. Amazing to think what they could do if they were just doing good things with that kind of energy and uh, thought processing. 
But we go on here. He, he, uh, he says, be you angry, don't sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, don't hold grudges. Don't hold grudges. And literally, if you can, solve your arguments before you go to sleep. But certainly, don't hold grudges. You know, you get an argument with your wife or your husband, and then all of a sudden they bring up something 20 years ago. Well, you've always thought that because you remember when you did No, I thought we apologized for that, you know. <laughs> and here they're bringing it back up and throwing it back in, in each other's face. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needs. And that's an interesting principle. Did you see the principle there? You should work so that you can gain and acquire to be able to give. Not so that you can continue to consume and be the old greedy curmudgeon that so many people are, but that you should be able to acquire and consume so that you can give, so that you can share. That's the objective behind the acquisition of riches and wealth. It should be driven by charity and love for your fellow man. And certainly, uh, it goes without saying that people should not be forced into doing those things, but should have the freedom to make their choices on who they give their money to in charitable uh, conditions or for charitable reasons. Uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of um, your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. Don't be mean-spirited. Don't, don't be, uh, you know, kind of an ugly individual where you're always a downer and criticizing, ridiculing, negative outlook, uh, always finding the bad in something. Look for good. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Try to work with people. Find some mutual level of access where you can have some commonality with an individual to build on a strength of some sort, no matter how weak it may be. Th those are important aspects. And and uh, traits to look for as you interact with people. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor uh, be done away with. Verse 32, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And one last closing uh, section over here in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, very important chapter. I think one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible here because it's really... Uh, a very uh, motivating and objective-oriented chapter. Chapter 3, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. In other words, set your goals high. And if you are indeed risen with Christ, then act like it, essentially is what Paul's saying here to Colossae. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affection, uh, and in this particular case, uh, what he's saying is your mind, set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth, for you are dead in your life, and your life is hid with Christ uh, in God. So essentially, your life is dedicated to God. Here, in dropping down to verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created. How do you do that? How do you do that? Have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. How do you do that? You do that by studying. That's how you do it. You got to take the time. You got to read. You got to study. You got to ferret out. You got to search the scriptures, investigate, and then not apply it to your neighbor, not apply it to your mate. Apply it to yourself to figure out how you can help your mate, help your children. And children need to do the same thing to help mom and help dad. You know, you wonder why you're always being uh, penalized, or spanked, or yelled at. Well, maybe it's because you're disobedient. You're not listening and consequently need to listen, especially in lieu of the fact that mom and dad are still paying the bills. I mean, that goes without saying. So a lot of this has to do also with us because for every action, remember, there's a reaction. Just like every cause, there's an effect. So keep that in mind. For every action, there is a reaction. Verse 11, chapter 3, Colossians, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, barbarian, uh, free, Christ all in all, put on therefore as the elect of God, verse 12, and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you, and above all these things, put on active love. That's what charity means, 
active love. Charity, which is the bond of completeness, because there now you're putting your actions where your words are. You're actually following through and doing something that manifests the principle by which you just read that encouraged you to do something. So brethren, take time. We've done a Bible, so we've done a presentation on fasting. We've done a presentation on meditation. We've done a presentation on Bible study. Take a sheet, challenge yourself. Read the Bible, get it done by December 31st. I may even ask for a hand raising on who completed it. <laughs> but take your time through it. Three to four chapters a day for the remaining uh, days of the year. And today's what? January 3rd. So we've got, um, we've got 10 chapters to pick up on. <laughs> and you've got the whole afternoon. So what else do you have to do, right? It's the Sabbath day. But go ahead, take that challenge. And also mix it up with taking some time to spend some time understanding what you're reading. Get that Unger's Dictionary, because you're going to come up on names, you're not going to know who they are. The Unger's Bible Dictionary will add color, context, insight, and help in getting you acquainted with the players and all those involved in the Bible that you're going to become acquainted with as you begin to embark on your adventure of reading the Bible. And God be with you. And God bless your efforts. And he will. And it will be a life-changing experience.